Basically, what we're doing today is we're going to run through a proof of concept that's been uh, put together by, uh, funded by Intel and um, sponsored by Amazon and the NCI as the client. Um, and Link Digital's role was just as the uh, consulting partner who helped to facilitate the work. Um, and the format for today is just uh, a couple of presenters. So we've got Shane Davis from Link Digital and Mohammed Atif from our NCI. Um, they're each going to do a little bit of a demo from their parts and a little bit of a slideshow presentation from their perspective of what, what the work is demonstrating and why it's useful. So without anything else, I'll hand over to um, Mohammed to kick off his part. So NCI uh, basically is a research-driven uh, organization and we are sponsored by Australian government and particularly CSIRO, Bureau of Meteorology, Geoscience Australia, uh, there are six universities out of group of eight, which are our partners. So we just, I mean, to put it very short, in short terms, we enable research. Um, the collaboration agreement of NCI was uh, between 2012 and 2015, and it has been since renewed for another two, three years. And this is our model. And these are all our, uh, basically, partners. Uh, today, NCI has got 3,000 plus users accessing our supercomputer. And we have got around 600 active projects. When we say active projects, these are real projects which are submitting jobs on the supercomputer or they are using our cloud facility. Uh, we have got 19 staff in operations that actually look after data, storage, uh, the supercomputer and the cloud infrastructure. And we have got around 20 staff, which is responsible for uh, development of HPC or related applications or sorting out workflow of research groups. Uh, we are partners with Nectar, RDSI, and ANTS. Uh, current infrastructure is we have NCI is Australia, I mean, host, hosts Australia's first petaflop supercomputer. It was ranked at, I believe, 24th in the world in 2012. Uh, since then, it has dropped a few places, but we are still the biggest supercomputing facility in Australia. Uh, we run CentOS 6. Point whatever is latest. At the moment, it's 6.7 uh, PBS Pro scheduler. We have got uh, 10 petabytes of Scratch file system which is rated for 150 gigabytes per second transfer. And we consume around 1.5 megawatt of power. Uh, data storage side of things, we have got tape drives, which is 10 petabytes. It's dual site redundant, so we actually have got two sites. If one side was to go down, your data is still safe on the other side. Uh, we have got, we are the biggest uh, luster shop in Australia, and I believe Southern Hemisphere as well, because we have got three file systems, uh, which we call global data file systems, one, two, and three, with over 18 petabyte of storage. Uh, when we say up to 55 gigabytes per second, that actually means the slowest. In fact, it's a typo. Our latest file system, GData3, is rated at 120 gigabytes per second. That makes it second fastest file system in the Southern Hemisphere. First one being Rigen's slash short. Uh, we have been in cloud space for a long time, uh, since 2009. Our first cloud was VMware-based cloud for web services. Uh, then we ventured into HPC in the cloud with DCC cluster uh, in 2010. It's now retired in favor of OpenStack deployment. We had a Red Hat-based cloud in 2012, uh, which was technically the incarnation of DCC. Uh, then we partnered with Nectar, and now we are running two clouds uh, as at the moment. One is called uh, Nectar Research Cloud, and the other one is Tension. Uh, 
I wouldn't go into details of these two clouds uh, because they're just open stack based 56 gigabit Ethernet uh, full factory clouds. And so they are tailored for high performance computing. Systems connectivity of uh, MCI, you can see Ryzen. It's hooked onto Ryzen 5 system, which is slash short, home, and all the other uh, file systems which are necessary to run a supercomputer. We have got GData, which is mounted across NCI. So it is a uh, Lustre file system, distributed file systems, but it is mounted across the entire infrastructure of NCI. The main thing being people can <clears throat> log into our cloud using virtual desktops. They can prepare their jobs. They can remotely submit their job onto Ryzen. They job once it gets executed, the data gets shunted back to GData and they can visualize data using GPUs and stuff. So it's end-to-end -end pipeline that we are providing. Why we want HPC in the cloud or why we have partnered with AWS. Uh, these are job statistics of Ryzen. Uh, the most critical thing is this graph here, which depicts CPU hours by number of CPUs requested. I'll draw a line here. These are CPU hours consumed by jobs which are less than 16 CPUs, or what we can say is they are confined within a single compute node. Not that much in terms of CPU hours. Predominantly, what we are seeing is <clears throat> 256 CPU and 512 CPU jobs are owning Ryzen at the moment. So people are running large jobs which require five per processes. We have seen jobs which require 16,000 CPUs as well. On another side, number of jobs by number of CPUs. You can see the number of hours by these jobs are quite less, but the number of jobs being submitted is very high. So it's causing a lot of pressure on the scheduling system for single loaded jobs, which are not essentially high performance computing. They are actually what you call high throughput. People just want high throughput. They want to submit a number of jobs, each on a single compute node and get their jobs done. They do not do internode communication. And that's where we say that why we need HPC in the cloud to complement NCI supercomputer. Let's just say jobs which do not really require multiple nodes, they can be offloaded into uh, to cloud. Uh, we want to have virtual laboratories where people can actually access remote desktop sessions. They can use GPUs to visualize their data on our cloud because we share the same fabric for global data with the supercomputer so they can see all these things, their data live on their virtual desktop environments. They can remotely submit their jobs. They can visualize, they can run web services on top of our cloud, on-demand GPU access. Then there are certain workloads which just do not play nicely with distributed file systems. So workloads which are basically small IOPS. Lustre is a file system which actually is bandwidth bound, so it needs bigger files. But if you are reading and writing a random IO of 4K, it's not going to play nicely with uh, Lustre. <clears throat> so we want such workloads to be shifted to cloud. Uh, pipelines that are at times not even suited for supercomputers, uh, packages that will never be supported. We had an application which actually required Oracle inside a compute node. It's a big no because you don't really want to run database on a compute node on a supercomputer. Then proof of concept before making a big run. You can run it on cloud, it's sandboxed. You are not sharing that environment with anybody else. Another interesting thing is cloud bursting. So I'll explain this thing in a later slide. Student courses and then NCI specific, you are logged into cloud, you prepare your job, you submit it onto Ryzen supercomputer, then you get data onto the cloud, you post process your job, and then via web, you can export it out and have collaborations with other researchers around the world. So it's entire data lives on at NCI. Where does Amazon fit? Or web services, Amazon Web Services fit? There is a lot of pressure on Ryzen, period. 
it's the biggest supercomputing facility in Australia. So researchers are actually, it's a competitive round where you have to apply for grant. And if you get a grant based upon your research outcomes and all the other uh, associated funding, uh, then you get a grant and then you consume that grant. But at the moment, Raijan is so much allocated that we cannot entertain new projects. We do not have capacity. Raijan is running flat out 98% all the time and still we are struggling. What another thing that happens to researchers often is their quarterly allocation runs out. So they run out of their CPU grant but there is still work to be done and they cannot run their jobs. While we do allow bonus jobs, but still they would struggle because their priority goes really low in bonus. How do they finish off their work, which they have started? There is a lot of people struggle at times, but we are a finite resource. So what we came up with this idea was, let's make use of NCI's cloud, but it would still be finite. Then we go one step ahead and we venture into Amazon Web Services. So we provision a cloud on Amazon for our researchers and then they can make use of Amazon Web Services or cloud and in the same field as they get in the same sort of environment which is there on right. So they don't have to really do anything fancy to get their jobs running on Amazon Web Services. Another interesting thing can be enable pay as you go service. You ran, you ran out of quota, there is no way. What you can do is you can just pay and get your cluster instantiated at Amazon and go through your, uh, carry on with your research. Uh, so basically you get same look and feel of Rygen, same applications would be there, except for certain cases where licensing agreement does not permit us to run that application outside NCI but there is no lock-in for researchers. So they are not bound to NCI only. They are not bound to any other supercomputing facility. They can actually migrate their workload anywhere in the world. Uh, we just want to help out researchers, that's it. So in partnership with Link Digital, Amazon and Intel, what we came up with was a platform which is almost Rygen and that's why we are calling it Rygen in a box. It's not full-blown Rygen, it's just Rygen squeezed into a box for researchers. We have done some benchmarks. I mean, uh, I'll give you a heads up that yes, in these benchmarks, at times you will have this feeling that Amazon is not that fast, but that's not the point. The point is to enable research and get maximum throughput. So clearly this graph, this depicts basically a difference between Ryzen and Amazon Web Services. Amazon runs 10 gigabit ethernet. Ryzen is 56 gigabit InfiniBand. So the difference is massive. I had to use even log scale to show the latency. But in the next slides, you would see if your workload is not communication bound, you actually get similar performance to that of a supercomputer. For example, this thing, uh, bioinformatics benchmark. So Trinity, uh, it's a very popular application and a number of bioinformaticians are using it. You can just have a look at this thing. Uh, Amazon is blue, supercomputer is red. It's hardly any difference. So I is better, but it's not that much of a difference where you say, oh, I need a supercomputer for this thing. If your job runs for one hour on Ryzen, probably it's going to run for one hour, 15 minutes on Amazon. Same is the case. We ran another benchmark on MD. This is a computational chemistry code. Uh, we tested at scale up to 128 processes. Again, AWS is in blue, Ryzen is on, in, depicted in red, and you can see AWS cloud is scaling quite nicely. I mean, 16 processes are taking like nine days for NS, but as you see, it's scaling quite nicely. So then we ran another scalability test for NAS parallel benchmarks, I must say this is not fair because NAS parallel benchmarks are communication intensive and floating point intensive. But the whole point is, let's not see whether supercomputer is faster or not. What we are interested to see is, is Amazon Web Services Cloud scaling? Yes, it is. 
So the whole point is you can run your applications at scale on this particular cloud. So at the end, I would just like to give you a demonstration how easy it is for a researcher to submit his jobs or their job on Amazon uh, Web Services. It's just similar speed as that of writing. Okay. So once you instantiate a cluster, which Shane is going to tell you how, you just look at the bash or shell. And the whole feel of this shell is similar to Raijin. We have got same file system, sorry for the typo. We have got slash short, we have got slash apps, we have got system, we have got opt, home. And what happens is it's the same sort of uh, queuing system, although it's in a way different because NCI uses PBS Pro as a scheduler here. We are using Slurm, but the main difference was PBS Pro is it costs dollars. So for researchers to run their services, we expect them not to pay that much for a scheduler. So we decided to use Slurm. It's still very much work in progress. We already have an interface for PBS Pro on Slurm. So most probably you are not even going to change your job scripts on writing, but at the moment we are just giving you an initial fee. So I'll just go ahead and submit a few jobs. I can so I'm going to submit an MD64 process job that would be across four nodes because each node on this particular cloud is 16 CPUs or cores of as well. The job 112 submitted. Uh, we have been testing this thing, so then I can just go. So I'm just going to submit a couple of NAS parallel benchmarks. And then I'll just go to so I've submitted all these jobs, and you can see they have even started to run. So this <clears throat> basically tells you state these jobs are actually waiting on resources. What resources? Because other jobs are running. So it's an eight CPU cluster. You can see uh, the first job that I submitted is running on node one, two, two, four. It's a 64 process job. It's using four nodes. 113 was two node job. It's using 32 processes. It's running. So it's as easy as that. You just log on to the system. You submit your jobs, get your processing done. So I'll hand it over to Shane now. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to present is um, is just how we uh, how we actually uh, built built the system on the on the Amazon cloud. Okay, um, so basically, what we've got here is, um, is is what the basic build consists of. Um, so we have a, a, a slurm control. That's the head node, uh, and then we've got our computing nodes underneath there. Um, now, on, on the control node, um, we've got NFS, and, and that shares out the config and the apps and everything that the compute um, nodes require. Um, and also what we've got up here is a couple of scripts that, um, that build the compute nodes. Now, the, the great thing about Amazon is that um, that's pay as you go, and you only need to run stuff while you're actually doing things. So, you know, if the if the cluster's got no jobs, it makes no sense to have a whole lot of instances run up. Um, so we built the scripts. We better built a set of scripts. So the idea is is that you can turn the control node on and off as you need it. Um, and what the scripts do is they allow you to run up dynamic um, uh, clusters for for when you actually want to you know run jobs etc. 
Now, and, and, and it's quite dynamic, um, which is, you know, again, the flexibility and agility of cloud. So when you use the build cluster script, you can tell it how many computing nodes um, you need. Um, so in this particular instance for the demo that we've done, we've got um, an eight, eight node cluster, but there's really no limit to, to how big the cluster you, you, you want to build. It could be 128 nodes, it's whatever you, whatever you want. Um, the other thing that you can do when you're building the cluster is that you can give it a cluster name. So Slurm gives you the ability for one control node to, uh, to control more than um, one cluster of compute nodes. Um, so, so you can have the one node that's controlling all of your jobs, but it's, it might be running one lot of jobs on one cluster and something else on the other cluster. It's really about flexibility. Um, you can pick the instance type. So the writing in the box, because um, we collectively wanted it to look exactly the same as what's at NCI, um, we picked an instance size for that, that, that matches what's down at NCI. But of course, there's various um, instance types that you can pick from Amazon that gives you more CPU, more memory, you know, whatever, whatever um, um, fits your requirements. And also, as um, Amazon refresh their fleet of, of, of instances, as new um, instances become available that have got more powerful processors, more RAM, et cetera, you can take advantage of that if you want to. Um, the other thing that you can do, which I'll talk a bit more about in, a, in one of the next slides, is you can also set the max um, bid price for, for buying spot instances. I've got a slide that explains what spot instances are. So the, and the short story is, is that um, the script we build, you, you use the control node, you tell it, I want a 16 node cluster, and it goes away and, um, and builds it for you. Now, one of the things that personally I really, really like about Amazon is this uh, ability to, to tag resources that you've got in the cloud, such as instances, and then couple that with the with the uh, with scripting. Um, so you can do shell scripting, PHP, whatever, Python, whatever you, whatever language, and you use the AWS APIs. So the script that we built, um, the, what happens is is that the each of the instant tags um, you define the, defines the node name. Um, it allows the node, compute node, when it starts up, to set its DNS record. Um, and also, it controls uh, the node placement. So, in the previous slide, where I showed you a couple of clusters, it, it figures out what cluster it's meant to be starting up in. Um, now, one of the cool things that, that you can also do with tagging and scripting um, is, as an example here, where you can grab the cluster um, name. That, so on the control node, we can run a script, um, and it basically can pick up the um, cluster name from the instances and go, are they running any jobs? No, they're not. Let's turn them all off. OK, so you could, you know, in the afternoon, you can set up your, set up your cluster, set up your job, go home in the evening, have the script running in the background, and know that in the middle of the night, when the job is all the jobs have finished, the cluster shuts itself down. And the idea of this is is um, minimising your costs. Um, the other thing that you're able to do as well, if if you're in this scenario where you do want to use multiple clusters, because you might want them for different groups of researchers or whatever the case may be. But the other thing you can do is schedule uptime for them. So you can say, you can have, have a con job that says, okay, nine o'clock every day, start this cluster up. Um, researchers can do their work on it. Um, at six o'clock, if you're not running, you know, as soon as whatever jobs are finished running, turn it off. So the maintenance of, of, of cloud infrastructure is is, is very easy when you use this, this scripting approach. Um, Amazon have a little um, 
pet phrase that they say, you know, don't have pets, have camel, uh, have cattle. <laughs> so don't treat you, don't treat your your servers and your commute compute nodes like that pets. Um, so this is an example of the um, multiple clusters. So the, the, the other way that we've built the um, script is that the control node defines what the compute node cluster is going to look like. So a bunch of parameters, you can just change a handful of tags on the instances up on the control node and it knows how to, you run, just run the same script with default parameters and it knows how to build the cluster. So, and also, so you've got the best of both worlds. You can just have a script you run and you don't have to think about it or build a cluster for you based on this. Um, you can copy this machine across and make a new copy of it, change a couple of tags on the instance, which I'll show you in the console later on, um, and you build another whole separate cluster. So if you've got a room full of um, students that are learning how to do supercomputing, each of them can have their own control node, their own cluster, and, and build it out. Or different research teams. So if you're in an organisation and, you, and you've got a few um, separate research teams or you want to separate out by project, you, you can just run a cluster up to run a particular project or whatever. Okay, so I mentioned before the, um, the spot um, instance market. So there's a few ways that um, Amazon allow you to purchase their, um, their resources. Um, all of it you pay per, per hour. Um, the, the one that very frequently gets used is the um, on-demand. So that is, you, you just, um, you pay per, you, for each instance um, type, there'll be um, a table that'll tell you how much an hour you're going you're gonna to pay. So for the C4 or 4X largest that we're using in this uh, NCI cluster, um, uh, you, your normal on-demand price is $1.15 per hour. Um, and if you run it for three hours, then it costs you just over three bucks. To, per, per compute node. Um, the other type of instant, uh, the other purchasing option that uh, Amazon offer is called um, spot instance. So they have this market of um, unused computing resources and you get to bid how much you want to pay per hour on that particular instance. So it makes it a really effective way of, of buying instances for unbelievable prices. Um, and, and Amazon provides you the tools so you can see what the current price is at the moment of, of you know, what's happening in the market. You can have a look at what's happened over the last couple of weeks and, and that allows you to um, bid at a price where you, you're guaranteed to get some resources and there's a bit of strategy to, if you bid higher than everybody else, then you'll keep the resources longer. So the, what we found is the more you use spot instances, the more savvy you get about, um, um, about buying them. Um, but, you know, the real takeaway point is that over the last two weeks, these, um, this particular instance size has been as cheap as 16 16 cents per hour, which is, you know, pretty crazy for, for that type of resource. And um, when I was working with Muhammad down at um, NCI, we found that um, the average sort of price through a two or three week period um, was around about uh, 20 to 30 cents. And the def so the default bid price that we built into the cluster was, was 60 cents. Um, and we generally got the resources that we wanted and, and we didn't lose them. And just interestingly on this point, um, Amazon and Sydney have two availability zones, so two separate data centres, and you find the bid price between the two availability size uh, zones differs. So everybody tends to buy the resources in, in AZA, and so we actually built this particular cluster in AZB 
<laughs> because nobody seemed to be buying stuff there and it was always cheaper, you know. <laughs> so probably now I've said this, anybody who's clued up will be buying in B and not A. <laughs> but, um, but that was kind of the flexibility that we, that we built into the design. Um, so one of the other, um, some of the other things that um, you can utilize that, um, uh, that Amazon offer is, uh, is the AWS orchestration. So for example, the, the, the scripts that we've um, uh, coded to build this are all bash scripts, um, but the next sort of logical evolution for that is to use AWS CloudFormation. Um, and what CloudFormation does is it allows you to have a script that builds all your resources in the cloud. Um, so it's just a script of I want this type of instance, I want this many of them. It does all the networking connection, it does the whole lot for you. You can script as much or as little as you want. So we use some CloudFormation scripts that um, just build a VPC and build the instances and then we run Chef over the top of that to actually provision everything. Um, so CloudFormation is really good when you want to build stabilised, you know, like a standardised stack that you're like a cookie cutter. It makes it really fast and easy. Um, the next, the next, the other service that Amazon offers is something called Opworks. Um, so that kind of sits over the top of um, cloud formation, and it's basically Chef Opworks. So it's it's running Chef 11 or 12 from memory. Um, and, and so this is what you use to build maintainable stacks. That is, you want to keep the OSs up to date, you want to um, keep your configurations up to date, um, and, and you want to have a standardised cluster. Um, some of the other services that Amazon offer that are really um, good for this type of application is um, a, a, a service called Cloud Deploy. And um, they also have um, code, um, code pipeline as well. So code pipeline is really good for continuous integration. Code deploy is really good for uh, you, you use it in, in conjunction with version control. It just makes it really easy pushing out new um, code to your, to your nodes. Um, so Mohammed touched on this point in his presentation as well. Really, the, the takeaway point here is that um, cloud gives you a huge amount of agility. So the concept, you know, there's, there's scenarios where you still have a different use for traditional, you know, hardware. There's scenarios where cloud doesn't replace that. But one of the things that um, cloud does allow you to do is, is be very agile to, you know, if you, if you need to quickly run something up to, um, um, to test it, then the solution allows you to do that. And what Link Digital have found as an organisation is, is this ability to um, think outside the square in terms of um, provisioning hardware. You think of all these new cool ideas that you can do that you just can't do on traditional um, hardware, you know. Uh, being able to run things up for an hour and then scrap them back down. But also that was where the idea of running the multiple clusters came from. Um, this ability to, you know, run parallel projects all at once um, on, on numerous different clusters. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it. What I'll do is I'll um, jump into the quick little console that we, we built a GUI front end for the um, for the cluster. Just It just gives you this quick look into what the nodes are doing if you don't want to use the command line or whatever. Um, and I'll also show you the, um, the tagging that I was talking about on the instances as well. Okay, so okay, so basically, um, Amazon provide a really good 
GUI interface and to their and to their resources. Um, but often when you just when you're running a computer, you just want to quickly see what's running, what isn't running, um, be able to quickly um, you know reboot nodes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we um, built this you know very simple um, GUI. Um, you can you've got the control node up here. Um, and then you've got each of the um, the slurm nodes, um, and if you click on the the view button here, we get the instance details. So it gives us a whole lot of details about the instance itself, um, and we also built it in so it grabs some information from slurm as well, and and just tells you what the cluster is actually doing. Um, and likewise, you can. Um, have a look at uh, individual nodes as well to see what they're doing. Um, and on the side here, that was a little bit slow to update. Um, so we can see things like CPU load. This is just coming straight out of. Um, the other thing that, that makes it handy and easy to do is we can stop and reboot individual nodes that aren't behaving. So I think realistically, you know, most people would run off the command line, um, and you know, it's the best of both worlds. The other thing that we started building into this was when you viewed the control node, you could actually tell it. You could define the parameters for a cluster and actually build the cluster through the GUI here. So it's horses for courses. It's <laughs> whatever suits. Um, what I'll do is. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is the actual um, standard AWS console. Um, and the main takeaway point here is these tags that I was talking about. So the, um, so the console, you can click on any of your individual resources, and much like the simple GUI I showed you, it just gives you a whole lot of technical information about the notes. Um, you, you can also um, have a look at the monitoring to see uh, what the what the CPU utilization, etc., is. Um, but the real magic of this is is these tags. Okay, so this is how the compute. They use the name here that defines the host name. Um, they know what their DNS record is, and where that's relevant is um, if we jump across to the Route 53 DNS, um, it uses this tag to update the DNS record. It'll create the record if it doesn't exist, or it'll update it if it does exist. And what's kind of awesome about the Route 53 DNS is that if you're querying the DNS from outside the Amazon network, it gives you the public IP address. If you're querying inside the Amazon network, it gives you the local IP address on the on the local network. So, and it's because of these tags and that ability that we were able to build the scripts that can get the control node to um, you know to build the cluster. So, yeah, cool. yep. Did you want to quickly share the cluster screen? Uh, no, no, that um, it's kind of over here. Um, yeah, so this was just a very simple form that we uh, that we put together. Um, that was, you know, that demonstrates the, the slide previously. So basically. What's the name of the cluster? Uh, how big do I want it to be? Um, what do I want the nodes to be called? Because, and that relates back to all the DNS and the slurp configuration and all the rest of it. Um, and then, you know, how much do I want to pay for a, per hour on the spot? Um, and we also have a script there. So by default, we, we do spot instances, but we've also got a script there where you can buy on demand. Uh, the reason that you'd want to use on demand is because there's there's no um, hot spot instances available, or they're virtually the same price as the on demand, and you just want to run a job now. Um, or the other scenario is where you have a long running job, 
go up and you don't want to risk your spot instances dropping out of the cluster. So the way that um, the spot market works is if I bid at 60 cents per hour um, and all the and there's and the instance pool starts getting used up and somebody comes in and um, bids at a dollar twenty-five, my instances will start getting terminated to fulfil that that higher bid. So you know the strategy against that is you bid higher, but you know the other thing is you use on demand. You're guaranteed to keep the nodes for as long as you you need them. So I just wanted to. Um Say so thanks to Shane and Mohammed, and obviously from the context of Link Digital and working under this proof of concept funded by Intel, um, working with the NCI and working with AWS has just been fantastic. And we really see this work in particular, while um, Mohammed's touched on it, Shane's touched on it. Um, one of the, the core interests we have is around um, open data, open knowledge, um, and one of the things that we see this really enabling within the market for supercomputer facilities is open research particularly from the perspective of executable white papers, where people will publish their data, they'll publish their code, they'll publish their narrative, their actual research paper, but they can also publish the orchestration tools to replicate that research with either different data sets or for peer review with the same data sets to replicate the results as well. Um, but also for open education, um, certainly where Shane said that um, if you put this into an educational context where anyone can spin up a cluster, they can gain access to it, um, I think that's really key where you don't really want this val valuable supercomputer facility tied up as people just learn the trade. Um, and even that expands the scope of what you can do with this technology where you may have people who don't, no longer have access to supercomputer computer facilities. So retirees or people who have done a, a change of life and they're working in a different sector, but they still want access to this stuff because they have a passion and an interest in running their computational algorithms or whatnot, running their simulations. So whether it's for um, business intelligence, analytics, um, uh, this sort of access is pretty, uh, I think, pretty important. So we'll be working on it a lot more. And um, I'd just like to say thanks to the NCI and Amazon and Intel.